Cinema and television have always told us stories in which an epidemic crisis shakes the world. Unfortunately, we are now living out a dystopian virus story for real. The coronavirus pandemic is testing us all. It is a major shock for the global and for the European economy. For the cinema and audiovisual sectors, the global health crisis created by the COVID-19 pandemic could well become an economic disaster if nothing is done to prevent it. COVID-19 happened and led to tens of thousands of screens worldwide having to close. The closure of cinemas has forced the cancellation or postponement of film releases. Audiovisual creativity is nurtured by travels, human contact and collaboration, which the lockdown has prevented. All the film and TV sector in Europe, but also outside Europe, is working with moving targets at the moment. As far as we have seen, the crisis has exacerbated the trends uh, that we had seen there before. The sector most immediately hit by the crisis was theatrical exhibition, that is, cinemas. In Europe, almost all sites were closed by um, the week of 16 March. And this means huge financial losses, no box office, concession, advertising revenues, significant fixed costs that cinemas still have to bear, uh, and temporary leave compensations for employees. Producers and distributors were next in line. The lockdown has uh, led to considerable loss of sales. No or little revenues were generated by the production companies since March this year. More than 66% of them were obliged to suspend or finish or stop completely their productions. Uh, a lot of them, more than 62%, were also obliged to stop completely their third parties' contracts. More than 50% were also obliged to um, uh, have lays off and more than 37% were also obliged to cut hours or put their employees uh, uh, with benefits. Financing of films uh, has been um, crumbling. Uh, no decision was taken during, during these months because it was too complicated to take a decision, to take for a distributor, to give an MG, or for a sales agent, to give an estimation of the FG, MG of distributors that could not release a film in theaters that are closed. In the TV sector, commercial broadcasters are also feeling the heat. Advertising numbers, uh, which have sharply declined, um, and we continue to see the effect of this. Uh, we're also seeing uh, impacts for pay TV services because of the absence of uh, different types of content, and notably, notably live content. There is definitely a major impact across the chain, uh, not to mention the operational impacts of uh, running uh, channels in this type of health emergency crisis. But it's not all bad news. There are two types of players that seem to be getting some benefit from the current situation. Public service broadcasters feel that their role as a trustworthy information source is confirmed in this time of crisis. As you know, inform, educate, entertain have always been key goals for public service media. And yet, never before so, as during the last few months of the crisis, have they been so vital for society, for democracy, people looking for independent, objective news on the, and the moment as it happens. Viewers have been up across all our members, even up to 20% across news. Website hits tripled. It's been a huge time for public service media. Public service media has stepped up offering educational content, offering entertainment content throughout the crisis to everybody in lockdown. But surfing the wave of this crisis are the VOD platforms. Global SVOD services such as Netflix are enjoying a surge of popularity. But they're not the only ones. Smaller VOD services providing European content are also enjoying their day in the sun. 
while other players of the industry were affected in the most dramatic way by COVID-19, um, needless to say, Eurovod uh, of your services faced a very sudden and massive overload of traffic. But also they were responding to the high expectations coming from the cultural players, so cinemas, festivals and ride holders. So there is a growing recognition that online viewing can increase access to a diverse, new and challenging work. The increase of the consumption doesn't only benefit the platforms, but also the right holders, because most part of our members still work on the revenue share business model. Moreover, our platform are not just technical tools, they are very editorialized offers with different identities, among which cinema owners that survived the crisis thanks to the VOD offer and to day and date release. This rosy picture is not shared by everyone in the industry. It brings up into a leap into the future where we can see the, 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 the supremacy of this platform on our industry. This supremacy is putting a lot of pressure on the, on the financing model of the independent industry as they, we used to finance our films. Obviously, more now more than ever, we should have also a, a, a level playing field where everybody is, contribute, is, is paying the same and, and is operating on the same uh, conditions than the others. So I think we think that more now more than ever, it's very useful to have uh, a proper response from the platforms in order to contribute to financing European works, to give us good promotion uh, to European works as well good data in order to uh, study the consumption of European works online. The audiovisual sector needs more and new resources. Video on demand platforms, who are nowadays important economic players, made the most of the current situation. It's therefore not more than fair that they contribute to its development. Firstly, by contributing to the film fund in the different European countries where they have an audience and secondly, by paying royalties to the authors of the films they are playing. Does this mean that the COVID-19 crisis is a catalyst for disruptive developments that were looming in the background? We asked Gilles Fontaine, head of department for market information at the European Audiovisual Observatory. I think it is fair to say that even before the COVID-19 crisis, the European audiovisual sector was in a state of fragile balance with at least two characteristics, a stagnation of resources and therefore um, pressure on the financing of programs and specifically pressure on the financing of films and maybe also a lack of resources to compete properly on the high-end TV series market, which is becoming increasingly a key segment. So my personal take is that rather than the disruption, the COVID-19 crisis is rather amplifying, accelerating trends which were pre-existing in the European audiovisual market. take decisive and bold actions now and this on all different levels. Member states should be encouraged and they should feel comfortable to take all the necessary measures to support the most affected sectors. We will do whatever is necessary to support the Europeans and the European economy. So what is necessary for the audiovisual and cinema industries? We have a fundamental need for specific aid tailored to our specific industry. One fit all solution do not work. At the moment, clearly the companies are asking very thoroughly for uh, having um, uh, grants developed to help them. The key message is that support measures will have to last in time and go beyond the lockdown period. We call on the EU as well to offer some support measures to ensure that the European audiovisual media industry can continue to do its utmost and its vital role for European culture and democracy. What is needed is indeed a political ambition, both at the EU and national level,
for the film and TV industry, including obviously some components of financial nature, to be reflected in the EU instrument. What is the reaction of the EU to these calls for help? Maria Gabriel, European Commissioner for Innovation, explained in a recent video conference with European culture ministers the specific measures introduced to support the cultural sector. On my side, I have stressed three horizontal measures that can and should be used for the sector. First, the Coronavirus Response Investment Initiative. Second, the new instrument for temporary support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency. Third, the temporary framework for state aid. This is extremely important as culture is specifically listed as one of the sectors most severely hit by the outbreak. In addition, I also inform ministers about sector-specific actions under the Creative Europe program. We are applying maximum flexibility within the existing rules for ongoing and planned actions. Special measures for cinemas via 5 million euro supplementary allocation of funds in the form of vouchers for cinemas most severely affected by the lockdown. Actually, together with Commissioner Breton, we are exploring how to adapt the cultural and creative sector's guarantee facility to mitigate the adverse effects of the crisis. At national level, there is indeed a huge variety of support measures. Maya Capello, head of the European Audiovisual Observatory's legal department, tells us about it. If I had to define with one word how European countries have been supporting film and audiovisual industries throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, that word would be diversity. Diversity of interests, diversity of approaches, of measures, but also diversity of the bodies adopting these measures. It has been national governments, parliaments, regulatory authorities, film funds, collective management organizations, they have all done their part. And the European Audiovisual Observatory has followed this process closely, regularly updating on its website a tracker where all the measures to support and guide the film and audiovisual industries have been collected. It has been possible, for example, to see that most countries have adopted cross-sectorial economic measures, which have indirectly benefited also the audiovisual industry. For example, measures to protect workers have also an indirect benefit on SMEs, self-employed and freelancers from the film and audiovisual industry. But beyond these cross-sectorial measures, of course, there have also been some sector-specific ones, which have covered most branches of the industry from the production to distribution, exhibition, up to the exploitation of the rights through the broadcasting and VOD uh, activities. Most of the measures have taken the form of the setup of emergency funds and grants, but there have also been some relaxations of rules and obligations and requirements with form and level and amount that vary profoundly across the countries. Some countries have also adopted measures to protect artists and creators who are the most vulnerable group among stakeholders. They have, for example, been relaxations of their conditions, allowing access to unemployment benefits. Where festivals and cultural events have been cancelled or postponed, there have also been measures in order to uh, tackle the negative consequence thereof. And then comes the audience. It has not been forgotten the regulatory authorities have done their part in order to uh, try to avoid the spread of misinformation with regard to the pandemic, avoiding a kind, any kind of abuse of the media. But the media themselves have also been supported by the regulators, for example, by relaxing rules uh, concerning content and programming obligations, but also requirements descending from licenses and fees. On the support measures, they've been very different from one country to another. And as a cinema, your luck might depend on where you're located. The range of approaches have included deferred business taxes, wage support, unemployment compensation, loans, loan guarantees, rent support, fixed cost support. And all of these are helpful. And the best case scenario would be a combination of these measures. And on top, ideally specific and dedicated support for the cultural sector or the visual sector that could also benefit cinemas. 
We've also seen accelerated support payment um, in some countries from FIM funds, suspension of levies, accelerated payment for the Europa Cinemas network. Cash flow for the immediate sustainability of the sector remains needed, as well as recovery investment to accompany the resumption of the production sector and to fill the insurance gap. What's encouraging is that indeed uh, the European Commission has shown significant uh, flexibility with regard to state aid measures, uh, which is very positive. Uh, then for the number of discrete measures, etc., I think there's quite a lot uh, member states have been doing or are doing, uh, but perhaps you know some can take examples on, on, on others. Uh, if we take, for example, the TV advertising market, I think a lot can be done still uh, to encourage advertisers to come back through tax breaks or through direct funding by uh, national institutions or, pan or European institutions of pan-European campaigns, for example, uh, on, on, on health and public safety issues uh, related to COVID. And then we have the film funds. They have readapted their way of working, uh, adapting existing schemes to the new needs, but also setting up new schemes in order to um, fight the negative consequences of the pandemic. For that, since the early stage of the outbreak, European film funds had to adjust their operations in order to keep ourselves um, working and trying to support the best way we can our sectors. So for that we had adjusted regulations, moving to online procedures from application to selection committees. And then, last but not least, we have the collective management organizations intervening in favor of their members with relaxations of requirements and deadlines with regard to copyrights and related rights, but also setting up specific funds in order to contrast the negative effects of the pandemic. The collective management organizations that the Society of Audiovisual Authors represent quickly mobilized their resources and efforts to support authors during the crisis. They have used their regular social funds and established emergency funds, sometimes with the Film Institute, while fast-tracking distributions of royalties, developing advance payment and advocating for government support. CMOs will continue doing their part, but this will not compensate the loss of authors' income due to the pandemic. It's up to the EU and national governments to make sure that their recovery plans reach screenwriters and directors. Indeed, the view that the audiovisual and cinema industries won't survive this crisis without important support from EU and national governments is shared by all the branches of the industry. We will need to continue to have a very committed uh, European Union and also a good response from the media, media programme. I, I think it's very important that we see uh, coherence uh, to ensure that uh, in the post-Covid phase we're in, indeed able uh, to uh, have touched on the immediate recovery needs but also lay the groundwork uh, for a sustainable and level playing field in the AV media environment. No one can predict where the film and TV sector will be in two years' time. Indeed, the future looks more uncertain than ever. People currently feel overwhelmed by a whole range of divergent information about the nature, origins, effects and evolution of the pandemic. In such unsettling times, it is good advice to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. We asked Gilles Fontaine what a worst case scenario might look like. I am afraid that there is a worst case scenario for where this COVID-19 crisis turns into a more systemic crisis. To name a few risks, recession would severely hurt TV advertising. Austerity measures would impact both the public broadcasters' revenues and the film fund revenues. Consumers, which have been exposed, initiated to subscription VOD services, may cord the cut with linear pay television. Smaller cinemas and independent distributors may face hard time to recover from the losses incurred during the crisis and face increasing difficulties 
to distribute and exhibit European films. So the risk is a decrease of resources of, let's say, the legacy players, which, in my view, is not likely to be compensated by the increase of revenue of subscription VOD services. And less revenues for the sector would come at a time where production costs are likely to increase, likely to increase due to precautionary measures imposed by the follow-up to the COVID-19 crisis. This is the worst case scenario with possible repercussions in the mid and long term. But even in the best case scenario, there are a number of challenges that the industry will unavoidably have to face in the short term. Well, I think we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, theatres are now reopening, uh, productions are ready to resume their work. I think we are in conditions to be back on business. Um, however, the crisis has brought some very, uh, very huge difficulties to a very fragile sector. Cinemas have slowly started reopening in a number of countries and this will be a gradual process. They will have to implement new measures, social distancing and safety measures, which means that they won't be able to operate at full capacity for some time. Risk of contamination on set creates new and significant costs for reorganizing the shooting and for getting insurance if you can get it. The sector's huge exposure and lack of insurance coverage for resuming activities remain unsolved in many European countries. We will need also the European institutions, the European Commission to invest uh, um, money on potential insurances that can help production companies in Europe to do their job. And that is a key point in the forthcoming months if we really want to see uh, our uh, business back at work and, and proactive once again in producing high level content, the, the content that the Europe is expecting uh, from us. Um, last but not least, it will be important to create a safe environment where all uh, the businesses, their cast and crews can work. So we really hope more uh, health and safety protocols can be developed in line and in synergy with the trade unions uh, at the national level. And we hope that we can soon get rid of the mask for the moment. We have to wear it. But hopefully, we will wear it less and less in the future and we can all go back to work and produce fantastic content. If there is a single lesson that we have learned from lockdown, it's surely that in times of crisis, culture is more important than ever. Indeed, the increased consumption of films and audiovisual content in the past two months confirm this. Television and VOD services have helped people get through the confinement period. TV sets, tablets and computer screens have become a fundamental presence in our lives. And yet we all miss the big screen, don't we? It's been great to see uh, a number of surveys in a number of countries showing the willingness of audiences to come back to the cinema and how much they've been missing the big screen and that communal shared experience of watching a film together. Cinemas is a special, unique and essential place. Um, and when audiences are able to return to the local cinema, they will rediscover the unforgettable immersive experience. And cinemas will continue to be the vibrant home of culture and community that they always have been.